right, everybody. Hey, we are really glad you're here. Do we have any 49er fans? <laughs> Next year, baby. Um, the, um, and here's, we're, I'm really, really glad you're here today. This is a heavyweight series we're jumping into. Um, would you all grab the message outline? Matter of fact, I want to make sure you all have this, okay? Um, so raise your hand if you don't have it, and they'll deliver you one. It's in your program. We, this, in the history of our church, we have never done an outline this long or this extensive. And some of you, so get it out right now. Some of you look at this thing going, oh, no, he's going to be talk forever. No worry. We've ordered dinner for you, so you're going to be fine. <laughs> It'll be delivered right to your seat. And what I want to say is this. Um, this message series is skeptical. This, for me, is the hottest week. We'll come back to that in a second. But this thing is six pages long. Some of you are going, Mark Clark can't cover a verse in six weeks. So the... Um, This is, we're going to have you, even if you're going, oh, I'm a paper-free person, I'm green, get this. You're going to want this as a resource. We spent a lot of time working on this, and we'll come back to that in a second. I want to start with this, though. I'm a pastor, which means I get sent all kinds of stuff, and one of the cool things I get sent is when a church screws up and has typos or stupid stuff in their church program or bulletin, people send it to me. These are, I'm not making these up, these are actual announcements from actual church bulletins. One church said this, don't let worry kill you off, let our church help. (laughs) Actually, it's somebody's bulletin. Another one said this, this afternoon, there will be a meeting in the south and north ends of the church. Children will be baptized at both ends, in some bulletin, okay? (laughs) Another one said this, Sunday night, Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will be speaking. Come here, Bertha Belch, all the way from Africa, in somebody's bulletin. I don't know if I should read this one or not. Uh, What the heck? Um, Weight Watchers group will meet at 7 p.m. at First Presbyterian Church this week. Please use large double door at back entrance, in somebody's bulletin. Okay? My my two favorites of this one. Tonight's sermon topic, what is hell? Come early and hear our choir practice, in a bulletin. And my favorite of all time, you teenagers look at this, a bean supper will be held Tuesday evening in the church basement. Music will follow. You bet it will. Okay? Now, sometimes, sometimes when the church screws up, it's really funny. And other times when the church screws up, it is not funny at all and brings a lot of heartache to a lot of people. Okay? And it's like, I want you to imagine this. And I've had this said to me a whole bunch of times. Notice, how in the world can I believe in Jesus when I look at all the atrocities committed over all those years. You have something in common here at this church. Mark Clark's a former atheist, and so was I. And we would ask questions like that, and now get asked questions like this, and you're going, how can you believe in Jesus when the church has screwed up the entire world? In other words, and you just, here's a list. You got the crusades, witch hunts, the Spanish Inquisition. You got centuries, this is true, centuries of pastors and Christians who gave approval to slavery. You had churches in the South 40 years ago that had whites-only signs on the church, okay? You had abuse scandals, televangelist scandals, megachurch scandals, abuse of kids scandals. And remember, one person like says this, the greatest proof that God doesn't exist is Christians. And those are what nice people are saying. The, um, and so people are going, Wow in, the, wow, in the world would somebody ever want to attack, attach to Jesus and the Bible and a church when Christians have aligned themselves with a faith like that? John Lennon, okay, put it this way. I got nothing against Jesus. It's his disciples that messed it up for me. I'm going to show you a quick video. This book took over the country years ago. It's called The Da Vinci Code. Anybody ever heard of it? Became a book, became a movie. And Dan Brown, it was complete fiction, but Dan Brown claimed it was fact. Now, this is some of the, this is going to go by really fast. It'll be hard to understand. It's got subtitles for you. Um, But this is what you hear a lot in mainstream culture. Check this out. For 2,000 years, the church has reigned oppression and atrocity upon mankind, crushed passion and idea alike, all in the name of their walking God. Proof of Jesus' mortality can bring an end. Oh, that's suffering. Sound familiar? 
I hear that as a pastor all the time. The church is a disaster. Christians are harsh. They're judgmental. They hate everybody and all of this kind of stuff. Raise your hand if you've heard stuff like this. It's going to be unanimous in there. Grab these notes out. We are going to prepare you, and there's extensive stuff on here because some of the stuff you've heard is true. Some of it is flat-out fiction and, and just made up by people. Um, we want to help you understand this. How do you respond? How, what do you do when Christians behave badly and churches behave badly? Okay, In other words, the church is full of hypocrites and judgmental people. There's a great quote at the top of it. Just take a look, right in your outline at that quote, okay? Sheldon Vonneken said this, the best argument for Christianity is Christians. Their joy, their certainty, their completeness. But the strongest argument against Christianity is also Christians, when they are somber and joyless, when they are righteous and smug, when they are narrow and repressive, then Christianity dies a thousand times. Yes. How do you respond to this kind of stuff? Are you all ready? Now, I'm also going to check in because this, some of you are here and you're going, sermons I like. I like a poem, a joke, and a story that makes me cry. Okay, if that's you, and it's, it's probably a bunch of you, this week is not for you. If you're going, pour it on me, welcome to Bayside on this week. Okay, and I'm going to talk really fast. You all ready? But I'm also going to go, I'm going to lose you a whole bunch of times. There's really smart stuff we're going to lay out on you. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to check back occasionally. I'm going to go, are you still with me? And you will really loud say yes. So we're going to try it. Are you still with me? Yes. Okay, just the teenage section, as loud as you can. These adults are kind of boring. Are you still with me? Yes. Oh, you're over there. Good. Switch stance, okay? All right, number one, what do you do when people come? First of all, is this, hey, don't get defensive. Don't get defensive. Recognize some of these abuses and Christians act like this have actually happened, okay? And by the way, you know why I don't feel any pressure at all to defend the behavior of Christians? Because the Bible doesn't defend the behavior of Christians. One of the things I like about the, one of the things I love about the New Testament, I was an atheist growing up. When I started reading the New Testament, one of the most eloquent proofs that the Bible is accurate is most people, when they're writing a book, they make themselves look really, really good. They're all claiming to be goat, okay? They make themselves, the disciples look like morons in the New Testament. They look like, as Mark would say, they look like a disaster because they are, okay? I mean, they're always arguing about who's greatest, and Peter's always whacking off some guy's ear, okay? Jesus have to follow Peter. There's, that's kind of what's going on. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul, who wrote the bulk of the New Testament letters, his very first letter was to the Galatians. And look on your outline, or look on the screen. Here's what he says to the Galatians. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. The earliest piece of writing we have from the Apostle Paul, and all this stuff was already happening back then. And then the Corinthians, he writes two long books to the Corinthians because they're a wreck. And he's public about it. And to the Corinthians, and this is really important, he says this, I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the servant's, serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow, and this is huge, would you circle this whole next phrase, your minds may be led astray from your, what? Sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Circle that. Every time a Christian goes bad, every time a Christian becomes toxic, every time a Christian becomes destructive and, and literally judgmental, every time it's because they've been led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And write this down. Whatever you're distracted from is whatever you're distracted by is never as important as what you're distracted from. Got that? Every day. And once, you're, once you get distracted from Jesus, then you start giving higher allegiance to something else than you do to Jesus. Matter of fact, uh, every church I know, every time I talk to a pastor, I'm going, oh man, this is going to be a tough year. Why? Because the election is coming. Okay? The election will be an amazingly great thing in every church in America if people's primary allegiance is full devotion to Jesus, not a politician. Because no politician, ha about, about half of you in Placer County are applauding. The other half are going, no, let's temporarily replace Jesus with somebody and call people cowards that don't do it. Are you aware, by the way, Jesus loved people you don't like. 
Jesus loved people that don't vote like you vote or look like you look. Is that okay with you? And let Jesus, by the way, just read your Bible, okay? And Jesus saved his harsh criticism, harshest criticism for people who held to tight doctrinal differences, but they had no love. They were the Pharisees. And these days, we have developed in America, like almost every culture does, people get distracted. The minute you get distracted from your eyes being primarily on Jesus, you become the Christian Taliban. And that's the last thing the Church of Jesus Christ in America needs, okay? The, um, now, I also want to say this. Um, the list of things when Christians get distracted from Jesus, then they get attracted to something else. And when they, get, when they get focused on something else, they condemn everybody and they turn into be people who are known for what they're against, not what they're for. And if you don't believe this, this is unbelievable. This is a list of things Christians and churches have actually publicly been against. Y'all ready? Dancing. You wear this? Christians gets dancing. Playing cards. Anybody know that? Okay, billiards, dominoes, Christians have been against gambling, sports, or any activity on Sunday, going to the movies, watching television, listening to the radio. You know where Christians banned, some churches banned their people from listening to the radio when it first came out. Why? Because the Bible says Satan is the prince and the power of the air. And when the radio first came out, it was nicknamed the airways. And they're like, oh, it's satanic, run. Okay? Um, Christians are also, have also been against wearing clothes with stripes. Just checking. Long hair on men, short hair on women. Christians have been against celebrating Christmas, the abolition. Christians were against the abolition of slavery. Were, some Christians and churches were against the right of women to vote. Some Christians were against caffeine, rock music, dishwashers, Harry Potter, SpongeBob SquarePants, music, drums in church. Raise your hand if you ever knew anybody who was against drums and guitars in church. Yeah, look around. Crazy stuff, okay? Christians were against dishwashers, shorts, sandals, wearing makeup or earrings. Now, that's not all. The list of things we've protested against are endless. To name a few, Christians have protested Disney, the Beatles, rock music, Teletubbies, Santa, the Easter Bunny, Procter & Gamble, Marriott Hotels. Some denominations came out against the circus, against interracial dating, against even against shaving. Duck Dynasty folks will love that one. Now, that's why you get a survey like this. This is actually good news and really bad news. It's going to go on the screen. Christians were surveyed, and they said, do you have... Positive, negative, or neutral feelings about Jesus. This is good news. 85% said, I have favorable impressions of Jesus. That's Americans. Isn't that good news? Then they asked them this question. Do you have positive, negative, or neutral feelings about the Christians that you know? Do you think it went up or down? <laughs> Look at this. 42%. Less than half the people that like Jesus like his disciples. Something's wrong. Wouldn't you agree? And I heard it again this week. I had an incredible week. I was down at Azusa Pacific board meetings. The new president is taking that place amazing directions. I've been mean, one of the best strategic God honor releases I've ever seen, making all these incredible changes. I, this is very exciting. And then we had a chapel and we had a lunch with this guy, Jonathan Rooney. Okay, and um, if you recognize him, he looks a lot like, because he's playing Jesus in almost everything, okay? He's, he's playing Jesus in the, the chosen, which is sweeping the country and is soon to sweep the world. So we heard some strategy stuff about that. And, and then he's also, he also played in the other Christian movie that came out this year, The Jesus Revolution. He played Lonnie Frisbee, okay? And so he came in and he told his story. He is awesome, folks. I went to lunch with him and a bunch of folks. He was incredible, okay? And he's humble. He's a committed Christ follower, fully devoted to Jesus, off the charts of prayer life. Um, and it, by the way, if so, somebody came back and said, what would you do? And I said, I just had lunch with Jesus. Um, <laughs> and, and he's an introvert, so he's, he's humble. And, and, the, and he's, he looks like that in person, okay? And he had four rings. He's got two rings on each hand. Um, two of them were skull rings. And he talked about, somehow, somebody asked him a question, and he talked about Christians and how Christians treat people. I know that because I get slaughtered all the time, but I figured who could, be, who could 
treat Jesus like this. So, so he said, I have gotten slaughtered online by Christians for having skull rings. And he said, see the skull rings? He's a Satan worshiper. He's evil. He's satanic. Shouldn't be playing Jesus. He goes, let me tell you why I have the two skull rings on. He goes, it's a deeply spiritual thing for me. When I became a committed Christ follower, and now I'm in Hollywood and the kind of becoming sort of a more well-known guy, he said the skull rings represent something deeply spiritual to me. They represent mortality. He goes, and which means this life is not all there is, and at some point you are no longer here. You are in heaven forever, so don't get caught up in all this star stuff. Keep your eyes on Jesus and eternity and make as much of an influence as you can with your life while you're here. That's why I wear these skull rings. And he said, I was blown away that Christians could ever attack me for being a Satanist when I was trying to keep my eyes on the right stuff. Is this crazy or what? Okay, we just kind of want to, there are some Christians out there that are like this. So number one is this, don't get defensive, okay? So in the light of that, what do you do? Number two is this, develop a biblical perspective. Number two is basically, you know, let's develop a, how would God and how would God's word want you to react to this and think like this? Are you all still with me? Yes. Okay, good. Here we go, okay? Here's the apostle Paul says this, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day. What's going on with false disciples and hypocrisy? There are two major reasons for every bad thing that Christians have ever done. All the hypocrisy, all the destructive stuff, all the mean-spirited people in the church. There's two reasons throughout history and modern times. Number one is this, and this is the church is full of people that aren't following Jesus. The church is full of people that aren't following Jesus. Jesus was crystal clear in his teachings that there are both false teachers, watch out for false prophets, and false disciples. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. So number one, you're going, sometimes the church is packed out with people that actually aren't following Jesus. And when this destructive stuff happens, they may be church people, but they're not following Jesus and doing those kind of things. Number one, the church is filled with people that aren't following. Number two is this, the church is not a gathering of perfect people. The church of Jesus is not a gathering of perfect people, and it never has been. I'll never forget this. It happened, oh, man, a few years ago. I walked out, right after this service, 945, I walk out in the courtyard, and it's a sea of people out there, and over on the side, I hear this voice, and I look across the courtyard, and she goes, hey, Ray, and so I look over, and it's this sharp-looking guy, he's on this side of the courtyard looking all over, two to three hundred people milling around out there, and he says, um... He's, by the way, sharp-looking guy wearing a Grand Bay golf shirt, smoking a cigarette after the service, and he yells this out. Hey, Ray! I look over to him, and he goes, that was a hell of a sermon. <laughs> it was Mark Clark's first week here. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm, ki- I'm kidding. Um, and I heard that, hey, that was a hell of a sermon. I know churches he would be thrown out of, don't you? I'm glad he's here. Are you? And so the minute he said that, I went, oh, I like this guy. So I walked all the way over. I met this guy, shook his hand, had a great conversation with him. And here's the entire time I'm thinking, man, you're obviously, he said, it's my first day here. That was a hell of a sermon, man. I go, hey, thank you very much. And I said, here's what I'm thinking the whole time. As I'm talking to him, I'm going, you're going to end up becoming a Christian. You're going to become a Christ follower. You're going to commit your life. You're going to go there, raise my hand table. You're going to take our one-on-one class. You're going to end up in a men's Bible study. And in about three months, you'll probably phrase that differently. The... um. And I'm glad those folks are here, okay? And by the way, so here's the deal, people. Y'all ready? Jesus lived a perfect life because we can't. Jesus lived a perfect life because we can't. So if the church is not a collection of perfect people, what is it? Glad you asked. Here we go. Um, this is a great set. Of, this is a great set of verses. The church here it is. I'm going to put these on the screen. If you have a phone, get it out. Just trust me. There's something. I'll tell you when to take the picture. But there's something on this thing. I want you to have on your phone so it's with you at all times. Okay. The um, this. If you're going, what passage in the Bible? What passage in the Bible is the deepest, most comprehensive thing on what does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to walk with God? What does it mean to have the power of God in your life? 
transformed, and through life. Which is it? It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it starts with these words, and it's written to the church. It says, as for you, you were what? You were dead. He doesn't say, as for you, you came to the church because you're perfect. You're lucky to have you. He says, as for you, you were dead. And then he spends a whole bunch of verses, you can read them later, describing what it looked like to be spiritually dead and what a disaster that is. And then he goes, however, and check this phrase. He goes, but it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Is that good news or what? He goes, you can't earn it, so you can't brag about it, which is what he says here. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we, and here it is. I want you to circle words there. Number one, we are, what's the next word? We are God's. Circle that word. Second, it says, we are God's what? In the notes, it's, it says, we are God's what? Yeah, I like this word better. It's workmanship. They kind of say the same thing. I'm going to use it on the screen. We are God's, and then it says, number one, we are God's. Second is, we are God's workmanship. And then it says, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Circle the word works. Okay, sort of the word works, good works, okay? Now, just look up here, okay? The, um, it says, number one, we are God. Okay, w- this is 945. Y'all had breakfast. You're probably caffeinated. I want this louder. Y'all ready? Number, because this is important. Number one is, we are God's. Then it doesn't stop there. It says, we are God's workmanship. So we are God's, we are God's workmanship, and you're created for good works, okay? So, number one, we are God's. Number two, God's workmanship. And number three, created for good works. Now, what does the word workmanship mean, okay? The word workmanship is a great Greek word. It's the word poema, from which we get the modern word, pizza hut. No, poem, okay? (laughs) And then, so, now, what does it mean? By the way, that is the entire Christian life. If you're going, I don't want to be one of those dead Christians. I want to be fully alive, That's how you do it. We are God's. Now, so what's the next step? How does that play out? Here we go. We are God's. That means you let God love you. We are God's workmanship. That means I let God change me. And we are created for good works, which means I let God use me. That's the whole Christian life. You let God love you, let God change you, and you let God Use you. That's the whole Christian life. And the, by the way, don't settle for anything. Some Christians are going, oh, I let God love me. That's all I do. I never change. I never let God change me. And I certainly never got God use me, okay? Which means I'm just a self-centered Christian living the love of God, having no impact, okay? Or other people are going, I'm just letting God use me. I'm frantically running around, but I'm distant and disconnected from God. So I'm bitter, angry, and empty while I'm serving. This will keep you emotionally, spiritually healthy. Does that make sense? It's the best thing in the Bible on the spiritual life. Now, if some of you theologians going, I'd like smart words that are theological. What's going on here? Here it is. Okay, next there it is. We are God. Let God love you. That's salvation. Let God change you. That's sanctification. And let God use you. That's service. Okay? Now, what's really going on, here's this. Here's the relationship God wants to have with you. Y'all ready? Here it is. God, let God love you. That is God working for you. Let God change you. That is God working in us. And let God use you. That's God. God, this is, if you're going, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean? Okay. Do you go on crusades and slaughter people? No. What does an authentic follower of Jesus Christ look like? You become a person where you've got such a deep relationship with God. God is working in you and then he is, work, he is working for you, he is working in you, and he is working through you. That's the Christian life. Everybody got that? Okay, now, I know you're all bored out of your mind, so I'm going to keep moving. You all ready? Here we go, okay? Number one, don't get distracted. Number two, develop biblical perspective. Number three, and that's where the outline's going to come in. Separate facts from mythology. Separate facts from mythology. He said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will you free. And now, for example, in his book, God is Not Great, Christopher Hitchens, who is an atheist, who is convinced that atheism is better for the world than Christianity. Now, he's so biased, he's blind. And so when he says that, he pretty much goes, um, he pretty much goes, religion poisons everything. So you actually have the right to ask the question, does religion poison everything? Does religion poison everything? And in this, you go, so it's a good thing to ask. In the last 100 years, we have had um, serious atheist regimes. 
okay? And Hitler, Stalin, and Mao in China. All you got to do is go, what has that atheism produced in the world, in their countries? And check this out, okay? Over the last 100 years, just three atheist regimes killed over 100 million people just in 100 years. That's amazing. And if you're going, why didn't Christians rise up and protest this stuff? Why didn't they rise up and object to the Inquisition or to witch hunts or to slavery or crusades or anti-Semitism? You know what? They did. Okay. For example, the Salem witch trials. It was not this. It gets blamed on churches all the time. Okay, they they drown these witches or they burn them at the stake or whatever. Okay. The um, it gets blamed on churches all the time or Christians all the time. It was that's myth. Fact is this, it was not the churches in town, it was the town council that condemned 19 women to death. And the pastor of the largest church in town was not driving that, he was the voice against it, and he actually said, don't do it. And later on, in fact, after that was stopped, the head judge, Samuel Sewell, became totally convicted that he was wrong. He went to that church and stood in front of the church, and he was the judge that presided over all these trials. He went to the church, standing for the church. He had his pastor read a letter he'd written in church, confessing his wrongs, and said he would dedicate the rest of his life to righting that wrong, and he did. He devoted the rest of his life to, uh, to literally writing wrongs. He wrote and published, and folks, this will give you chills, okay? This is the first, ever, that guy, after saying that in that church, this is the first ever book written in America. It's the very first anti-slavery book that anybody ever wrote in our country. And it was a novel based on facts about a young slave named, named Joseph and all the horrors he went through. And after that book was released, protesters, like literally the anti-slavery movement was lit on fire by that book and it exploded like a wildfire all the way across the country and every single Protestant pastor in the matter of fact, I'll list these folks, okay? John Wesley, Charles Finney, John Newton, they all condemned slavery and stood up against it. And of course, the most successful was a strong Christian, William Wilberforce, and eventually he succeeded and slavery was abolished in the British Empire, lit on fire by a person convicted in the church and they lit the fire and slavery ceased to exist, okay? Now, that's just one example. At some point, you gotta go, look, there's all these myths that people say, what are they? And so, this is awesome. Turn this, open this thing up. I'll, I'm not gonna read this whole thing to you um, until dinner arrives, but would you grab this and take a look at this? This is such valuable stuff, you had to have a copy. And if some of you still didn't get a copy, you can pick, we'll give you one on the way out, okay? Um, and see this stuff? Most of this stuff came from this book. Mark Clark has written a book called The Problem of God, The Problem of Jesus. I wrote a book called Jesus Called, He Wants His Church Back. And um, this book is in the lobby. This stuff is out of Mark's book. And I want to say this. Mark's not here, so I could say this and he'll never hear it, uh, unless he's listening. Um, Mark Clark is a gift from God. He is, I believe he's been put on this planet and moved to this state to influence our country and how Christians think. Um, Mark's an interesting combination. Um, Mark is a theologian. He's an apologetics genius. And basically, Mark is this. He's an intellectual with energy. There's only one of those I'm aware of. You either have energy and you're not that smart, or you're brilliant and not that interesting. Mark is both. And and this book, matter of fact, um, this book, The Problem of God, I will give it to the first teenager to come up here and get it. It's free. Wow, there you go, man. What's your name? Ephraim? Let's welcome Ephraim. Good job, bud. What are you doing here in the front row? Um, the, so you can buy one in the lobby afterwards, ex- except for you. Um, this, now, all I want to do is introduce you to this thing. Y'all still awake? Good, here we go. Turn to the first page, okay? And the problem of hypocrisy, Christianity's violent past, and all of this is out of chapters in the book, The Problem of God, okay? And for example, Mark says this, first, the widely held view that religion is the primary source of the great killings, conflicts, and atrocities throughout history, which has been said all over the place, okay? 
He needs to be challenged head on. It's simply not true. To do that, let's look at facts versus mythology. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of that section to you because you could read it yourself, but I want you to, there's a whole section there on that, and it's brilliant stuff. Then, here's another section here, okay? The Crusades and the Inquisition. Take the Crusades and the Inquisition, for instance, to call these religious wars wherein the church was slaughtering tens of thousands of innocent Muslims is a misunderstanding. At the time of the Crusades and the Inquisition, Western Europe was fighting complex geopolitical wars while being culturally Christian. So it was not a bunch of Christ followers letting God love them, change them, and use them. It was about politics, not faith. Got that? And he, by the way, this his whole section here is Genius, okay? Go to the next thing, okay? Catholic versus Protestants, the war in Northern Ireland. Take, for, take a modern example like Northern Ireland. Timothy Keller points out, it's often argued over the last many decades that Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland are fighting a religious war. Raise your hand if you've heard that. It's on the news every time. Protestants and Catholics, okay? But the reality is they're not fighting over faith stuff. They're not fighting over transubstantiation, paedo-baptism, or the doctrine of justification by faith. Their fight is for autonomy, retribution, and who gets to run the country. These are not committed followers of Jesus wanting people to have pure doctrine. These are political freedom fighters. We got that? As a matter of fact, I've been in Belfast a bunch. There is a massive fence Okay, right down the middle of the city, barbed wire on top, Catholics on one side, Protestants on the other. It's not a religious divide. I know pastors there that during all those 30 years of troubles, they were, they were holding meetings with authentic Christians on both sides going, how do we help this thing get better? Okay? The, um, I was walking down there with a guy a while back. We're walking down Belfast, and as we walked, he literally went this. Catholic, Catholic, Protestant, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant. Everybody walked through. He knew whether they were Catholic or Protestant. It, it wasn't their faith, it was their clothes, okay? Kind of like Kevin Thompson and Mark being on here. You can tell who's who. Um, the, okay, go to the next one, and there's more on that. Trivial objections and Einstein. This is brilliant. When somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I've just looked at Jesus and his followers, and, they, and uh, his followers don't behave well, therefore I'm not believing this stuff. This is brilliant. What's actually happening when a person refuses refuse to believe on God based on the actions of another person or people group throughout history in the present world? I think what's happening is what scholars call, this is brilliant, a trivial objection. The next time this comes up, just say to somebody, you should read this thing in here on trivial objections, okay? It's a study of logic, a trivial objections. Let's say next month in some scientific journal, it's exposed that Einstein was a kleptomaniac. In other words, Einstein going, oh, this, you know, all of his the theory of relativity, he transformed pe what people's views of science and what he said is scientific fact. What if somebody went, you know, I saw Einstein shoplifting. So let's throw out everything he said. Nothing he said is true. And he's going, that's a trivial objection. And this whole section is brilliant. And if you open this thing up, he has things to say about the witch hunts, the Salem witch hunts, does religion poison everything, trivial objections. And his whole section there is just brilliant. And he has a conclusion to that. This is just really great stuff in here or grab his book on the way out because a lot of the brainwashing that has been done by the other side has been accepted as fact and it's sincere, it's sincere fiction, okay? And the fourth one is this. Y'all still here? Okay, good. Fourth one is this, okay? Don't get defensive. Develop a biblical perspective. Separate facts from mythology. And number four is this. Recognize the positive impact of connection. Recognize the positive impact of connection. And one of the things you have to do is to go this. Look, if churches have turned out to get distracted from Jesus and his call and become destructive, what should a church be? Like, what should it be? Glad you asked. Where do you find that? You find the answer where a church should be in the? Very good. And you find that in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when it details exactly what the first early church was like. And this is awesome. It says, they devoted themselves. They were all in. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, so Bible teaching, and to fellowship, connecting with each other, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were what were? In their living rooms watching. No, all the believers were together and had everything in common. And this, here it is. They sold 
property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That's awesome. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. And in, this is awesome. And enjoying the favor of all the people. Praising God and enjoying the favor of, of who? All the people. Does the American church enjoy favor with people in our country right now? No. Why? Because we don't live like this. And when we live like this, people that disagree with us will love us. Make sense? And notice how it wraps up. Enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who are being saved. If, uh, but there's one more resource in this thing. If you just turn back one page, the impact of the Christian church. When you take a look at the impact of authentic Christians and the authentic Christian church, okay? And you can read this later, but I wanted to have the information. Um, the Christ, we transformed human rights. The Christian church launched almost every inner city hospital in America. The Christian church relief work all around the country. Uh, the dignity of women was elevated. Read this stuff. Um, education. All, the first 115 college university all launched by churches and Christians, including Harvard and Yale, okay? The um, edu is educated language and literature, art and music exploded because of the Christian faith. Science, look at all the primary first scientists, almost all believers in Jesus and launched by that kind of stuff. The impact is incredible. Now, is that going on now? Is that going on now? So I love this guy. He's a very, very secular, very, very left-wing New York Times writer, okay? And... He wrote this. He's not a Christian, and he, he, but he campaigns for uh, people's rights all over the world, for human rights. And he said this, whenever I show up in a hellhole in the world to help, Christians are already there helping, and no atheists are, have I ever been seen. That's a great admission from this kind of guy. I was in a slum called Mathari. Uh, matter of fact, our family's been to this slum. And it is the most devastated place I've ever seen. It is a few square miles in circle. There's no running water. There is no heat. There is no electricity. There is nothing. And there are over a million people living just in a small section. And it is a disaster. I mean, the homes are a disaster. There's no pavement, no streets. The whole, it's just, and you walk in there and you go, first of all, the driver. We walk in with this driver. And the driver says, the driver says, um, he stops and he, um, I wrote down what he said. He said, see this place? The only people who go in there who don't live there are Christians. And here's, he said, and they're their only hope. So we walk in there. And normally in some of these places in that country, you can't walk in. It's too dangerous. This, people are so poor, it's not dangerous. They have nothing to hurt you with. And so we walk in, and you don't know this. You have done a ton of work there, okay? There's a church there with 300 sponsored kids who actually get education, food, medical care, and all of this kind of stuff. And you, all, you paid for the whole thing. And these kids are attached to the church, and they're being educated, trained. They get a future. They have people that care about them. They have people that care about them. All because you all gave that. Matter of fact, are you aware of this? There are 7 thousand kids who have a future because you are paying to support them and sponsor them around the world. You broke the record for the amount of sponsored church uh, kids as a church, okay? And that's the stuff is good news. And so we're there, and while we're there, we're at this church, and then we're walking through the thing, and then we come back to this church, and these 300 kids are there, and the only kids with hope. And I get back later, and I'm looking through pictures two weeks later back here, and one of our business guys had snapped a picture, and I hadn't even seen this. So we snapped this picture, and here it is. This is a little girl, and we're all, all the church is gated. This is a little girl, and she's on the other side of the gate, okay? And so all these kids are in here, and we're all in here, and she's outside the gate, and she's hanging onto this gate, and she's looking into the church with her face looking like, they just won the lottery, and, I'm a, and I didn't. They have a future, and I don't. They get cared for, and I don't. They get food, and I don't. They get clothes, and I don't. 
And so I got back, and so we contacted the pastor of that church, sent him this picture, and said, do you know her? And we said, because we're coming back. So a year later, we went back, and we're there, and we showed him pictures again on the phone. He said, oh, he said, I know who that is. He said, it's a sad story. Her dad died. Her mom died. She was taken in by an aunt, and her aunt died. So she has nobody. So she just kind of wanders around and tries to survive. And we said, can we get her in here? He said, well, we're limited to 300 kids. And I said, if we pay for it, would you have 301? What's he going to say? So he goes, yeah. So later that afternoon, they find her. They bring her to the church. We pay a sponsorship fee. And now she is on the other side of the fence. And women, some of you women made her clothes that have been delivered over there. It's amazing what's going on. We went back, saw her the third year. Total transformation in a kid. The, um, that's Jesus. We also, we also... Uh, Sherwood Carthen, you remember him? Legendary bishop in this town. We developed a really good friend. Sherwood said to me one time, you know, I don't think you get that the schools in my part of town, they don't look like the schools in your part of town. And I went, that can't be true because our government is so competent, they would make sure everything was great. <laughs> so we hop, in his, we hop in his car. We spent an entire day, just me and Sherwood, driving the entire that whole community, we went by every city school, and the more we drove, the more depressed and mad I got. And that tends to be a good sign, because these, some, you get this fire lit inside of you, and you're going, we got to stop this. By the way, would you agree, it's not fair. It is not fair that any kid would grow up in our community with and have their starting line behind every other five-year-old kid. Would you agree? Just because no kid should be starting back because it, at school because of their race or address in this community. Would you all agree? This thing has got to get fixed. Our government's not going to get it fixed because they're the ones that let this happen for 40 years. Okay? So we went, we literally went, what are we going to do? We went, okay, let's shut our church down. Let's shut all our churches down. Let's go to go to one arena and let's raise money and let's rehab as many of these schools as we can. And so... We're actually, I have no faith about this kind of stuff. So I go, all right, let's do it. But my wife and I get up that morning, and we're going down to Golden One. And Carol goes, what do you think is going to happen? I went, nobody's coming. He said, you know, 12 people will be there. We'll take them out to lunch. And um, here's a picture of the last time our church has banded together and went to Golden One Arena. Somebody came up and said, technically, there's more people here at the Kings games because you seated the floor. And... We took a second offering, and a half million dollars later, we had the privilege and the honor of rehabbing completely six schools in the inner city that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And one of the principals was there. He met Christ at the service and has been walking with God ever since because evidently good deeds still lead to good news, which leads to openness to those good news. Okay, make sense? Okay. And the last thing I want to say, and then I'll wrap up, is this. Um, the, um, first of all, Thanks for listening to all this kind of stuff. I know this is like taking a drink from a fire hose times five. Um, and, um, and here's what I really want to say. And I, this is about as politically incorrect as it gets, okay? But I actually don't care. Um, books have been written. The church gets criticized all the time. Our church gets criticized all the time. Every large church gets criticized all the time. Christians get criticized every day. And you're kind of going, whatever. Um, the books like Death by Church, Loving God When You Can't Stand the Church, and some of you have been hurt by the church, and I'm really, really, really sorry for that. Um, but here's what I want to say, and maybe it's because I was an atheist growing up, maybe it's because I grew up outside the church. I, I love Christ's church. I love the Christian church, and I know that's politically incorrect. I love the church, and let me tell you why. It was the Christian church when I was 18 years old that introduced me to Jesus when I was trying to talk them out of becoming Christians. It was the Christian church that healed my image of God, healed my image of myself. It was the Christian church that challenged me to grow. It was the Christian church that taught me the Bible. It was the Christian church that told me I needed to connect to a small group. It was the Christian church that challenged me to give. It was the Christian church that challenged me to actually find out what my spiritual gifts are and use them to serve. It was the Christian church, folks, it was the Christian church that let me lead worship one time. 
And it was a Christian church that helped me figure out I should never, ever do that again. Um, it was also the Christian church that healed my image of marriage. Um, my mom and dad um, became alcoholics. Then my dad became an alcoholic, rageaholic. And their marriage ended up blowing apart. Crazy, heartbreaking stuff. Um, when that happened, it was no surprise. Because my mom and dad's divorce was like every single marriage of my family tree. Uh, all, both sets, of, both, all the grandparents were divorced. Everybody on the, you can look back 140 years in my family tree, you can't find one lasting marriage in 140 years. You can find a bunch of successful people, business leaders, judges, stuff like that. You can't find a lasting marriage. It's a disaster. The difference is this. At age 18, I go shocked everybody, and I go to a church. And I connect to this church. And I meet Jesus, and my image of God and myself and marriage are transformed. And when that happened, anything's possible because your past does not matter to God. And what happened is this. I meet Jesus, and then I meet somebody named Carol, and we get married, and we've been serving them together ever since. And about three months ago, we had the privilege of celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary, okay? And, um, and we, have, we have four kids that I love dearly. We have 3.6 grandkids. Um, that some of you know what that means. And last night, we were, they were all over because is this our birthday week? They all came over. We had this blast at a birthday party. And I'm sitting looking around this table. I'm going, thank God for the Christian church. And I run into people all the time. They go, oh, I just don't think Jesus or the Bible or the church makes any difference at all. All I have to do is take out my family tree, look right at them and say, let me tell you the power of this. The power of Jesus Christ and the power of really connecting to a Christian church broke 140 years of past patterns. Your past does not matter to God. God will love you. God will change you. And God will use you. And then your life will be something beyond anything you ever dreamed. That happened because of the church. Hey guys, Pastor Mark here, one of the senior pastors around here. So glad that you are actually part of Bayside Online. You really are part of our family. We have grown uh, over the last couple of years online a ton, and we really do consider you as part of our church family. So what that means is make sure you subscribe and share this, it's great. Uh, but also get in a community group, start watching the Bible study, start being engaged, even give. Uh, one of the ways that we can actually do online church and have this global community and even do the ministry of our campuses is by people partnering with us in the gospel, as Paul talks about in Philippians chapter one. And that means by your resources, financially, there are people all over the world getting blessed through what we do at Bayside. And so obviously part of that is giving and using and stewarding that for the glory of God. So we super thankful if you do that. We'd love you to start doing that and just super thankful you're part of our church. So glad you're with us. Make sure that you let us know you're watching and part of this because we want to get in touch with you and thank you and serve you any way we can. Anyway, thanks guys and we will see you next week.